The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Good afternoon or evening, everybody. My name is Alan Blumpkin. I'm here with my good friend David Nemec for another session of uh, David Nemec's uh, History and Trivia, Baseball History and Trivia. And tonight we're going to discuss uh, players who came into the majors after World War II who played multiple sports. Welcome, David. Welcome. Thanks, Al. Good to be with you again. It's always a pleasure. Okay, uh, where do you want to start? <laughs> uh, well, it's it's interesting because I you know I was a couple of years, few years older than you, so uh, I got a head start in that um, I had seen my first Major League Baseball game during the war. Uh, I had not seen any pro football during the war, even though I was living in Cleveland. Uh, my father went to the 1945 NFL title game uh, when the uh, Cleveland Rams beat the uh, Washington Redskins, Redskins by, yeah. one, by one point uh, when Sammy Baugh, uh, who was in the end zone then, uh, be, began behind the goal post. Uh, there were ten, a ten yard, went 10 yards deep behind the goal post. And the red and Sammy Ball was trapped in the end zone, attempting to pass. Uh, and his pass hit the upright, hit the uprights from behind. And there was an automatic safety at the time. And the Rams, who had missed an extra point uh, in the game, ended up winning winning the game by one point uh, by virtue of that safety. Uh, and the Rams then moved, and uh, the Cleveland Browns came in right behind them in the Rebel AAC, in the All-America Conference. And um, as a kid, when I started collecting cards, I started a couple of years earlier than you. And I uh, remember picking up cards of uh, players like Cliff Aberson, for example. Uh, Ab- I, you know, I, I didn't realize it then, and it wasn't until football season started, that Aberson actually was playing both uh, with the Green Bay Packers and with the Chicago Cubs. And um, there were a number number of players who were doing that back then. Uh, some were playing in the AAC, some were playing in the NFL, and uh, they were also playing either in the minor leagues or major league baseball. And as you yourself pointed out, this was true in other, other, uh, other, sport, other professional sports, which had not as yet achieved anywhere near the popularity of Major League Baseball, but we're still trying to struggle their way up the ladder and uh, collect an audience. And, uh, you know, basketball at this point, right at the Second World War, was certainly one sport with that. And you, you mentioned yourself uh, one, of the, uh, one of the better uh, basketball players who also ended up being a very good Major League Baseball player. Uh, when you said Frankie Baumholz, because Frankie Baumholz played with the uh, Cleveland Rebels, uh, along with playing Major League Baseball for a year or two, and was an excellent, excellent basketball player and could have stayed in both sports, but then went on to, you know, carve his niche in, in, in baseball and stayed there. But uh, I don't know if you remember this uh, from collecting early cards or not, but sometimes if you collected football cards, you'd end up with a card with a guy in both both a baseball uniform and a football uniform during the course of the uh during the course of the year. Well one of the ones in the middle fifties whose career was ruined by a auto accident uh, was Vic Janowitz. Yeah. Yeah, Janowitz was pro- probably the most famous case of that of that order. He he was uh, a Heisman Trophy winner in uh, nineteen fifty with Ohio State. Uh, which then was coached by Wes Fessler and still used a single wing. And Janowitz was playing tailback on the uh, – he pat, both passed and punted, kicked extra points, ran the ball, and won the Heisman Trophy his junior year of college. 
And then uh, what Fessler moved on, he knew his, his days were short at Ohio State. Uh, and they hired Woody Hayes, and Hayes brought in the T formation. And there was really no place for Janowitz in the T formation because he wasn't really a great running back. He was a great all-around back. And uh, Janowitz did end up with a successful pro football and semi-successful Major League Baseball career. Uh, he was allowed... Uh, it was not allowed. Woody Hayes really frowned on his players being two sport players, and uh, the, one of you know, Janowitz was certainly one that crossed cross paths with him. And another was Howard Hopalong Cassidy, who also became a Heisman Trophy winner later in the fifties with Ohio State. And uh, Hayes forbid Cassidy from playing baseball until he was a senior, when he no longer had any football eligibility left. And then oh, he's wow. allowed to play football, but he could do, he could do that. Then he could deny these guys dual sports. But uh, you know, as far as the professional sports went, um, this this was you know this was something uh, that was pretty pretty common then. And uh, you know, guys guys made a living in both in both sports. And sometimes it came down to having to make a choice. Oftentimes, usually football would supersede baseball because the there were very few guys who could hit who, would, who were going to give up baseball to play pro football. Uh, and, and then and Ernie Nevers, I know that's, that was earlier, but I think Ernie Nevers yeah, played both. Ernie Nevers, yeah, he did yeah. both. Uh, George Hallis did both briefly. There were, there were, you know, Patty Driscoll, I think, did both. There were a number of players in the Hall of Fame. Uh, who played both uh, football and baseball? And well, we um, had a guy at uh, when I went to the '78 Saber Convention, which was in Paramus, New Jersey. I get they have they had real, really old uh, guests, and the, they had uh, somebody named Hinky Haynes. Yeah, who played with the Giants, uh, football Giants, and I think he played with the Yankees a little bit. He did. He did. He did. He, I think he played on two. I think he may be, I don't know if he still is, or I think it was at the time, the only guy who played in both a World Series and an uh, NFL, NFL title. Trip. Yeah, NFL championship game. And uh, I don't know, didn't Deion Sanders subsequently do that? Or uh, I can't remember, but I think he did. Or well, three that uh, you know, of recent vintage, or Deion Sanders, Bo Jackson, who was playing both very well until he tore his knee up in a, a football game, and uh, Brian Jordan, who played for both the uh, Atlanta Falcons and the Atlanta, I think the Atlanta Braves. Yeah, yeah, that's but that's the, true. Those are three recent examples. And there, there, there are no. There really aren't. Are, are there any from uh, the twenty first century? No, not, uh, as, not as far as I know. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it. I don't think it's even. I don't think it's even attempted anymore. Well, yeah, but back uh, in the money those years, so, back so in those days, yeah. back in the old days, uh, the schedules didn't overlap that much. No, you're yeah, right. the, uh, yeah, football was playing eleven, twelve games. Baseball was playing 154. And I always tell you know, people, says, what, what was the, one of the big uh, things of the 1955 World Series? And I say, it was the last time they had a World Series game in September, and that's not going to end soon. No. They'll have a game in December before they'll have one in September. No. So the school, the, 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 it didn't overlap, and uh, you know uh, George Crow played in the NBA. Uh, so did uh, Dick Grote, my buddy Dick Grote, and Gene and, Connolly. Uh, Gene Connolly and uh, uh, and the uh, Dave the Busher. Dave the Busher. Dave the Busher. He played both basketball and baseball. Uh, there, there was uh, Bud Grant who coached the uh, Vikings forever. Was on a couple of real early Minnesota, uh, uh, Minneapolis Lakers championship teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was 
Yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 interesting though because um, I I I was I was looking up a guy. I don't know if you've heard of him or not. He was he was all he was all he he uh, he was an, he made the All NFL team in 1946 at fullback, Ted Fritsch, who played with the Green Bay Packers. Uh, he played about oh, six yeah, seven yeah. years, and um, yeah. his, his, um, his descendants run a very big baseball card uh, company. Yeah, Fritsch had a, a very brief professional base, baseball career in 1944 and uh the reason i i came across them because i've been reading i've been reading a book that i'd like to discuss for a minute too called in cub chains actually rereading it i read it for the first time about uh, 20 years ago it's by a guy named boy tepler uh whom i happened to make contact with while he was still alive and he's got a fantastic story that we can discuss at another time, but uh, Tepler was in 1944 in the spring and uh, went to camp with the Los Angeles Angels in the PCL. And also in camp with him was Ted Frisch. And um, Tepler was still a teenager at the time. Frisch was a little bit older. And Frisch went, uh, uh, he was sent by the, and Frisch, Frisch joined Kepler on, that, on the Nashville team later in the 1944 season and uh, finished the season in the Piedmont League, played only at one professional baseball season, and then ended up being a pro, pro football star. Uh, but baseball ref, and I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but at oftentimes when you go to the player info pages, it doesn't say anything about these guys like Frisch, who had a you know, really pretty good, pretty solid NFL career, doesn't even mention his, his pro football experiences. And uh, that pu- always puzzled me. And it, uh, all, it, the same thing happened when I looked up Charlie Trippy a couple of years ago. And Trippy at that time was still alive. I don't think he is anymore. I think he recently uh, passed. Uh, he, 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 I think he was 100 when he passed. Yeah, he was, and yeah. Uh, but his ba- his I don't know his baseball page at the same t- at the time didn't even mention that his NFL career at all, and that he'd been a, he was actually in, in enshrined in in Canton. And uh, I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and why? And baseball ref still seems to have these huge uh, gaps, not not including these guys somehow. I don't know why they're missing, but. Uh, in any case, uh, I think it, they probably never thought of it. Uh, the, the cross sports, uh, yeah. Well, well uh, you, you have they played. May like not have, they may not have. But in any any case, as a result of finding finding Frisch's page in Baseball Ref, it doesn't include anything about his football experience. I looked up Frisch Frisch on. Uh, pro football, uh, you know, pro football yeah. ref, and it too has very little to say about. Him. Now, this is a guy who was a, a uh, you know, a, a, he was in all NFL in 1946. It has a birth date for him, but no death date. And I don't know if what your experiences are with pro ref, pro football ref. No, I, I haven't gone go there very often, yeah. Yeah, I haven't either, but I don't know if yeah. it just has these gaps because it hasn't filled them in or do, relies on baseball refs to furnish them with death dates for guys who play two sports or what. But both baseball ref and pro football ref uh, lack a death date for Frisch. And if he were still alive, he'd now be... No, I can't. The guy would yeah, be... A- over 100 be, years old if he's still He'd be alive. 123 years old if he's still yeah. alive. Yeah. And uh, clearly, it's, at some point, uh, you know, he, at wars with other, other players, like Cl- Cliff Aberson, who played with both the Cubs and the Packers, uh, Aberson died very young. I don't, I, don't re- I don't know what the cause was, but he's only 51 years old. And Aberson had tremendous promise in both uh, Major League Baseball and, and uh, pro football, I thought, 
as a kid, I remember hearing about him and uh, my father, you know, looked up on him as uh, pretty good in both sports and, you know, and he played, you know, and he, and he had power as a hitter. And uh, he also uh, was in a single, he, uh, the Packers used a single wing then, I think at 46 and seven. And Averson played in the single wing with Frisch. And uh, they both, they both teamed up and, you know, and that, and they were both in, in the Cubs organization at the time. And uh, Averson did end up playing for the Cubs. Uh, the guy I'm reading about, Boyd Tepler, unfortunately never did. And it's a, it's a, a story again for another time. But um, but it is interesting how in, in those in those years anyway. And it really it, it really was, if we track it back to even to the 20s and 30s, there were quite a number of football players who did end up playing playing Major League Baseball. Uh, well, Jim, Thorpe, Jim, Thorpe, Jim Thorpe is obvious. <clears throat> Jim Thorpe was an obvious one, and Ace Parker uh, yeah. is, is, is another guy who's enshrined in Canton. Uh, yeah, Brooklyn was a Dodgers, good, foot, good Brooklyn ball football player. Dodgers, yeah. Yeah, with the football Dodgers, and he also yeah. played for the uh, New York Yankees in the AAC in 1946. Yeah. And I think his last last pro football appearance may have been in the title game in 46 against the Browns. Um but uh, Parker had what seemed to be a fairly promising career ahead of him in, in uh, Major League Baseball, but he couldn't. But he really couldn't hit, and that that stopped him from ever uh, catching on. He, he played a, played a couple of years with the A's, but uh, wasn't wasn't a very good hitter. And was Ken uh, Strong one of them? Uh, Strong played minor league baseball. I think yeah. he was very successful. In minor league baseball, but I don't—I don't think he ever played in. No, he never played major league baseball, to my knowledge. No, no, but no, he, but no, he no, definitely, no. Definitely is strong. One, he's definitely one of them. Um, and yeah, I'm looking at his career right now, and he—he uh, he, he got as high as well. What is? What was shortly Triple A, but then it was Double A. He got as high as Toronto, Double uh, A in the International League in 1931. And he, you know he hit 340, uh, and um, in 1930 he hit 373 with Hazelton in Class B New York State uh, League, and uh, he, he was a, re- a really pr- he had a promising career in baseball, but he tossed it in to go with football, and ended up being being a great great uh, contribution to the NFL in the 30s. And uh, the, 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 the two names I was thinking of, uh, that were, you know, especially uh, Paul Geal, who was a two-time All-American football player at Minnesota, and he became a giant, New York Giants baseball bonus baby. The Pirates had him for a little while, but I don't think he ever played in the NFL. No, I don't no. recall him he be, either. He became the athletic director at the University of Minnesota where he played the football. They also yeah. had another college player, pitcher named Lauren Pepper, who was uh, prominent at Southern Mississippi, or Mississippi Southern, I think it was called back then. And he he should have stuck, you know, somebody uh, put up something about him years ago, and I put that, and he should have stuck to football. And, and there was another guy, um, you you may remember, because he had, a, he, had, he had some time with the Mets, Galen Cisco. Oh yeah, Cisco was a fullback at Ohio State, and uh, went to the Rose Bowl with the uh, '57 Buckeyes uh, in his last year, his uh, last year of eligibility. And then he, uh, instead of going to the NFL, he decided to cast his lot in baseball, and did have did have a. I wouldn't I wouldn't call it a substantial career, but at least had they became a pitching you know, coach. A recognizable A lot career. of those early Mets became pitching coaches. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not. <laughs> I don't know what they learned from Casey in those years to help them, but it must have been something because uh you're right. Yeah. And uh yeah, Zisco, Zisco was one of the one of the guys I remember I did bat against him in batting practice once and I was a freshman in Ohio State. And uh, 
he was with the varsity that year and uh, pitched, pitched batting practice against the freshman a couple of times. But he was pretty, you know, he, he was a good pitcher and a good football player. And uh, did Bobby Lane or uh, Doc Walker ever play minor league baseball? Um, that's uh, that's interesting. If they did, I'd never heard of it. But Bobby Lane is the kind of guy that would have tried it. Yeah, because uh, I remember reading a biography of him years ago that had a lot of errors in it, but said he was a pretty good baseball player. Well, wait a minute. Let me look here. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good catch on your. And I didn't know this. Uh, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah it, the uh, baseball ref lists him in 1948 as a pitcher with Lubbock in the West Texas New Mexico League. He was six and five. I didn't know this. Wow. He had a one one point eight five seven whip. But the West Texas New Mexico League was infamous as a hitting. I know for hitting, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. even even with a, a even that with Bobby a, something or other with seventy five. What was that guy's name? Yeah. Bobby uh, Cruz. Bob Cruz and and yeah. Bob, yeah, Cruz. C R E U E S. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And the Roy, I think Roy Sander played there, and you know, and. Uh, and the, the one with the seventy Bauman at seventy two one runs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, look, you got to look at this. This is this is incredible. Lane and and had eighty four innings. He started. He started. Uh, uh, tw- he made twelve starts. And eighty four innings, and he had a one point eight five seven WHIP and a seven point two nine ERA. And guess what? He had a winning record. He had a six and five <laughs> record with Lubbock in the New Mexico, <laughs> Mexico League. And let me see who else was on that team because that uh, if we had any other two way two way players, I'm looking. I'm looking. Go, go, just give me a quick glance down. Yeah, because I think way back when I, I, I may be wrong on this, but way back when I think we did I think on. Uh, Fathers and sons that that play different major league sports. Yeah, yeah. But Bobby, but Bobby Lane, wow. Uh, He's one. He's to to me, Bobby Lane was personified nineteen fifties NFL football, Um, almost more than any other player, because. Yeah. Every, well, every team, when I went every, to Pitt, he was by the time I got to Pitt, he was on the Steelers. Yeah. And there was a gin mill that we used to go to. Uh, that was owned by the old ball player Frankie Gustine. Oh yeah. And uh, when the Steelers were in town, the back room was Bobby Lane's place. Nobody could go in there except of his own, uh, he, he was unbelievable. And was a story that, uh, they had a back uh, named uh, Tom Tracy who was also had been with the line in Detroit. And there was one game was that the, 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 both, they both got drunk. And the, on a Saturday and they're playing Sunday and it's a hot day and Lane is handing off the ball to Tracy a lot. And Tracy comes back and says, "Bobby, you, I was with you last night." He says, "Well, you, you got to play the pi- pay the piper." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he was a piece of work. Yeah. No, he was. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know, actually, baseball ref bullpen uh, does have Doak Walker's name up too. Not as, wow. but doesn't have any. It doesn't have any. Uh, I don't think it has any stats for him. It doesn't even have any teams listed, any minor league teams. Okay. So he Did may Sammy have. Did Sammy Ball play but minor league ball baseball? You know, that's that's another good one. I think he did, as I recall. Yeah, I think he did. Um, 
Let me look. Yeah, 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 he did. He played shortstop. Uh, he went to TCU. Uh, yeah, that, oh, that, that, no, this, is, this is interesting. This is interesting. Yeah, ball played. Not only that, but uh, wait a minute. Uh, let me see what he was. He was the backup shortstop to Marty Marion when oh, wow. uh, Marion when Marion was still in the minor leagues. Uh, he backed him up in '38, 1920, and uh, he was 24 years old at the time. He played one season, and he started out in what what was shortly to become Triple A. It was Double A still in '38. Playing with both Rochester and Columbus, the uh, Cardinals' two top farm Cardinal teams. Cardinal system, so yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He, uh, yeah. He did. He he couldn't hit. He did. He had a 200 career average in 53 games. Uh, little power, but uh, no stolen bases. Interesting too. And uh, but 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 he was apparently a pretty good fielder. Uh, no, he did, he also did the punting for Washington when he was playing there. Yeah, he did. He did. He, did. Yeah. he was. He was. He, I think uh, TCU was another single wing team, and they used uh, ball came up in the single wing yeah. and then converted. I'm, you know, I think a lot of those guys converted uh, after World War II to the T. To the uh, but Bob, by the time I I did see Sammy play in the fifties, when in one of his last years with Washington, and uh, uh, he didn't have much at that time because Washington didn't have much either at that time. But uh, yeah, Bob did have a one-year career, and and, and Trippy Tri- Trippy actually showed some promise as a ball player. I think he hit uh, you know he hit he hit over three hundred and had a pretty good season. Uh, with Nashville, I think it was Nashville, in the Southern Association, as I recall. But uh, yeah, there were quite a few pro football players, and in fact, you'd probably be hard pressed to think of any. Uh, well, I don't think Cecil Cecil Isabel. I don't think he played any any uh, baseball. I'm pretty sure he didn't. I don't recall. Uh, no, him. I don't think he did either. No, Don. Well, wait a minute. Uh, Hudson, I'm not so sure about it. Hudson. I think Mayo. Let me see if if as Isbell is any. No, uh, I don't think Arnie. I've been not a grand play pro basketball. Um. Yeah, I think Graham did play pro basketball. Yeah, the, it may have been in the National Basketball League, which was uh, an operation when the uh, you know the the, uh, the what became the NBA was originally the National Basketball Association. What well, was the Basketball Association of America? Yeah, and they merged in the nineteen forty eight forty nine season, and they brought in Fort Wayne and Minneapolis and Rochester and. Uh, a couple other teams that didn't last very long. Syracuse yeah. came in. Yeah, yeah. And the, of course, have. the most infamous two-sport uh, player was, of course, Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Oh boy. yeah. Yeah. And years ago, sports ESPN ran a thing: the best athlete of the 20th century. It came down to. Babe Ruth and Michael Jordan. And I told people that uh, they're going to pick Michael Jordan because he's still he's still alive, he's alive, and they did. And I said, anybody who thought Michael Jordan was the greatest athlete of all time never saw him hit. Well, I did. I did. I was fortunate. I was playing in senior league ball in Arizona uh, one fall. It was his only fall, actually, when he played professionally, and he played in he played in the fall league. Uh, and I got, I saw him play. Uh, I think in three at bats, he th- yeah, three at bats that day, and, uh, and he struck out <laughs> twice. And Dusty Baker and I don't know, I don't remember who was with Dusty. They were sitting, they were sitting a couple rows behind us, and they were talking about Jordan. And uh, Baker was saying something, something like, 
if he started about ten years earlier, I think he would have stood a chance because I think he can. He could. He could have. He could, this is one guy you could develop into a hitter. You can really. It's very hard to develop a guy into a hitter, but he, I think, he could. And uh, he just started a little bit too late. He's he's over thirty. His reflexes are not what they were when he was ten years younger. He, he's not. He, he's never going to make it. Uh, but Baker did did think fairly highly of him as an all around all around player. He's a good pretty good outfielder. He had a good arm. And he looked like a ball player. He, you know, he, he looked when he I think he did get on base once and he looked pretty good on the bases. I don't remember that he stole any, but it, he he definitely had played the game before. It wasn't just a walk on. And uh and, uh yeah. Another one just came to mind was Tim Tebow. Oh yeah. Yeah. Who, uh, I couldn't stand them because ESPN, you know, those days they got on, once they got on a topic or some personality, they'd beat you to death with them. And Tebow was one of them. And Tebow, yeah. after uh, after uh, he couldn't make it in the pro football after a couple of years, the Mets signed him, for God knows why. They couldn't cut the bus. They played a couple of years in the minors, but they couldn't cut the uh, cut the uh, make the pages at all. Yeah. Now you see them in the occasional commercials. Yeah. You know? I'm trying to, uh, you know, it's. I'm trying to think if there if there have been any. Uh, you really? I don't. I don't even. I don't even know of any college players who have played two sports. Um, you know, baseball and football, at least not with, uh, not gotten attention in, in both in two sports in in this century <laughs> as yet. I, I can't think of any. And, well, I'll um, tell you something. Uh, the year before I went to, went to Pitt, Mike Ditka played on the basketball team. Mike Ditka played? Yeah, and... Uh, you know, I, I had a few friends who were a year ahead of me, and they told me one of them in particular who unfortunately passed away nine years ago from pancreatic uh, told me that yeah, I hadn't lived. You haven't lived until you see Mike Dick to play basketball. <laughs> he was he was a hatchet man. <laughs> I yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I saw, yeah, Frank Howard played played baseball. And, basketball uh, played and basketball, basketball, yeah. Yeah, he was. He was close to an All American in basketball. Uh, definitely could have been in a substantial NBA career. And yeah, Johnny Havlicek. Johnny Havlicek was drafted by the NFL. Dave yeah. Winfield played played uh, was drafted by football and basketball. Yeah, and and and. and uh, the Cleveland Browns drafted drafted Havlicek, and um, he had not played in college at all. Hayes, of course, or not 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 only Hayes, but Fred Taylor didn't want to see any you know Havlicek anywhere near a, a, a basketball or a football field. But he did allow Taylor, Taylor allowed him to play baseball, and Havlicek played first base for the baseball team, played forward on the basketball team. And was drafted by the Browns, and he was the last player ever to be cut in training camp by by a Paul Brown coached Cleveland team, and uh, that was Brown's last year as a coach. He was he was Brown's last cut. Brown thought that much of him as a potential football player, but told I think he told Havlicek, he said I you know I definitely would like love, love to have you play with me. I definitely would, you know, I definitely, you would definitely have a place on the team and you would be played. But I think your future, I have to be honest with you, I think your future lies, you're better in, you'll, better, you'll be better off in basketball. And um, well, yeah. with that, he sent him off and we know what happened. But Havlicek became a tremendous NBA player. But uh, when, when I interviewed, yeah, when I interviewed Dick Rowe in 1985, you know, I had know, I had known that he had play, he played uh, 26 games with the 52-53 Fort Wayne Pistons before he went into the Army, and uh, he averaged 11.9 points a game. This is pre-clock, pre-24 yeah. second clock, 
this was like uh, you know uh, the Jurassic and the uh, you know Jurassic period in the NBA. And uh, he told me when he came out of the army, he was in the army in '53 and '54. Uh, he went and uh, he was still calling him Mr. Ricky, you know, at that point. Uh, you know, when I interviewed him, he said uh, he wanted to play both. And, uh, and he, he, he Gro told me he brought up Gene Conley. And Ricky said to him, he says, first of all, Ricky is a backup. Uh, Conley is a backup center. You play basketball, you'll be playing 40, 45 minutes a game. Because he was an yeah. all-American all American, uh, basketball player at Duke. Yeah. And he loved it. And... Uh, he said that you're gonna. Yeah, he's a pitcher, so he has to play every day. If you 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 come with us, you're gonna be playing our fifty games a year. So you can't do it. And in those days, the season uh, season hardly overlapped. And yeah. uh, so he he told me he went uh, with the baseball because that was where the money was. Yeah, you know, where it was at that time. Yeah. And uh, he said that, uh, and he he did the color color uh, uh, broadcasting for Pitt Bears. In fact, that's what when they came into uh, St. John's is when I interviewed him, uh, and he did the the color on the Pittsburgh the Pitt radio broadcast for years. So basketball yeah. was really his first love, and baseball was. Uh, yeah, you know, because of the economics, he played baseball. Well, yeah, I I think he made a wise choice. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I I remember seeing him actually play play with 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 the Pistons, and um, wow. he was good. He was good. But you 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 had you it was it was in the it was in the early fifties, and. Yeah. Um, Fifty-two, those, fifty-three. After and, he finished his rookie season with the Pirates, the NBA, the NBA at that point had a contract to have a game shown every set, single Saturday afternoon. I don't know if they had any other night or any other day reserved for, for by the NBA, but they were on they were on a, a national channel. I can't remember which one it was. Uh, every Saturday afternoon, and they would have they would showcase all the teams. Um, and well, there uh, were only eight of them at the time. Well, I, I know, know, I know, yeah. I know. And, but, and they and they had to stagger they had to stagger the, the time somewhat because they all weren't in the same time zone, as I recall. Um, I think a couple were in the central time zone, and uh, Chicago didn't have a team then. Fort Wayne, yeah, there were. It was. It was interesting. Yes, Fort Wayne, Minneapolis, uh, the Hawks, I think, were in Milwaukee at the time. The Knicks, yeah, and uh, the Roch- Rochester, no, Rochester, but, but, New York was in the West, and you had the Knicks, the uh, Syracuse, the Celtics, and the Philadelphia Warriors. Were the Hawks in Milwaukee, or are they going to St. Louis? They went for. They were. Came in the league as the Tri Cities Blackhawks, and uh, oh, that, oh, a lot of right. people, yeah. well, a lot of people were stunned when they they, they went from seventeen <clears throat> to ten after forty nine fifty, and uh, the, 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 they survived. And they wound up going to Milwaukee for about four years, and then they moved to St. Louis, and now they're in Atlanta. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I know football and basketball history pretty. Uh, yeah, you do. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you do. You know. Yeah, the yeah the early the early NBA the early NBA was very interesting to me to watch. Uh, it was it was integrated. Uh, there were very few black players, but there were there were several, and they were mostly very good players. And there were very few guys who were on the bench. Uh, the guys who were on the bench usually were with the Celtics because the Celtics had a very deep team, and that's why Conley only was substitute with them but uh the style there were there were there were guys who had one hand set shots two hand set shots all the yeah. all the old stuff that that disappeared when the when the clock came in and uh 
other features other features of the game the three second violation uh i can't even remember what year well, that, the three that second in. violation came in because of george Mikan. yeah exactly because he camped under the basket and you couldn't move yeah. him. and the, but, the story about why they put the clock in there was a playoff game i remember watching part of this i was 10 i think uh, 53-54 it's just, Syracuse was playing the Celtics. The game went four overtimes. Bob Cousy got 50 points, 30 of which were from the free throw line. <laughs> and because uh, in those days, they also you know, shot offensive fouls. There was no team limit on fouls. No. And, they, and, and I think it was the Dumont Network. They cut the game off. They refused to televise it past a certain point because cutting into uh, other programming. And that's when, the, after, because of that game, that's when the, the powers that be in the NBA uh, decided that they needed a clock and they needed a team with enough fouls per quarter. So what, what, why did they put the, 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 the clock? I thought the clock was put in because there, were, there was a lot of stalling in the, toward the end of the game. He, yeah, and, and you that had that, and you had, uh, you know, then, yeah, they had the, in 1950, there was a infamous game between the Pistons and the Lakers, 19 to 18. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah the stalling and the shooting, of, you know, offensive fouls or one-shot fouls, uh, that became yeah. a parade at the end of the game, yeah. Yeah. I, I, Foul I parade do, at the I end of the remember, game. I do remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I was, you know, that. But I remember that. I remember that. You know, I, by that time I was starting to play, you know, organized basketball in, high, in junior high and high school, and I remember how the rules would change almost every year. It, oh and, yeah. Uh, and you know, I had one shot that I was very good at, but it was, and I, and because I was tall for my age. I was I was put at center and I was of no use there because you know I I I wasn't a good terribly good rebounder I was underweight and uh, all I had was my height as an advantage but the one thing I had was a deadly set shot from outside and at that point it was a very little use to put a guy my size in the lineup and putting him into rebound because he never got to take his shot which was outside so. Uh, it was only a two-point shot, and uh, I yeah. Well, I, I I hate the yeah. I hate the three. I do too. I absolutely because uh, yeah. I, I remember watching a playoff game years ago where uh, one team was leading the other team by five, six points in the third quarter, and the team that was behind starts flinging threes up there. There's no tomorrow, and they couldn't hit them. Yeah, and uh, it, to me, it, it really. Uh, it hurts hurts the game a lot, but I can tolerate it because of the skill of the players. I can tolerate a lot more than I can some of the things that go on in baseball. Yeah, it's I have I have trouble with pro basketball. I have trouble with basketball in general because I don't I don't like the three point shot. And uh, yeah, I, I thought that I thought that kind of ruined the game. And you know, I could go along with some of the other changes. And uh, the twenty four well, second block was fine. The, you know the foul, the foul shooting, and all that, and but uh, the three-point shot. Uh, you know, well, I don't well, know. LeBron, a couple months ago, LeBron James passed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the all-time scoring leader, and I don't remember they, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar taking three-point shots. And when it was the all-time play. scoring leaders, they mixed them in. It's yeah. sort of like when baseball discusses postseason statistics. Yeah. I don't remember Mickey Mantle or Yogi Berra playing in too many LCSs or LDSs. No, not too many. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, yeah, and I hate that when they do that. I I do too. I do too. I think single. I think season records and postseason records are you know for the postseason records. I think you have to cut them off at a certain point, and that's when you went to you really when you went to uh, you know two division play. And then, you know, division, postseason division, you know, championships, league championship series. And then now, now it's ridiculous. And, you know, you can play how many, what's, what's the maximum number of games you can play in the postseason now? Oh. 
over it's 20, it's, isn't it? Yeah. it if, you, if you don't get the buy, it's three. It's five, three, five, seven, and seven. Yeah. So it's so 22, play, I think that adds up to, you know. Yeah, 22 games. Imagine that. The yeah. 22 game postseason, and um, Babe Ruth never got to play more than a seven game postseason, like in 26. Yeah. And uh, well, neither did yeah. Mickey Mantle or uh, yeah, know. anybody up through 1968. Exactly. And, uh, exactly. and uh, in basketball, it's 28. Oh, every it's every playoff round is seven games. It's ridiculous. But the, it's just the one thing that really drove me up was when uh, I think it was Pujols going for 2,000 RBIs, and I you know, said, well. Yeah, and they didn't include Babe Ruth. And they said, well, it didn't become an official statistic until 1920, even though they had been keeping it since 1907. And they were telling me that Babe Ruth had 49 home runs with the Red Sox without driving a home run. (laughs) And ESPN, I expected that. Uh, But when MLB started that, I I went absolutely, absolutely ballistic. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. I don't know. They made they made some very strange decisions, and I, I think it's 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 ruined uh, it's ruined my my interest in in in, in career stats and you know yeah. in stats in general. And there are some stats that are beyond belief. They're so attenuated that you know it's like. It's like measuring the amount of steps to the plate from the dugout, and then you yeah, know, and to... that's the philosophy and the watch yeah. angle. And uh, yeah. there was a uh, there was a uh, Yankee game I was watching uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and they, 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 I had to turn the announcing off because they were spent two win- two innings talking about launch angle and uh, as a philosophy, and uh, somebody asked me. Uh, few weeks ago, who led the league in ghost runs last year? Ghost run were those runs? In yeah, from the extra innings, they put a ghost oh. runner out there at second oh. base. Oh. So I said, I said, I have no idea, and furthermore, I don't care. <laughs> do they actually do they count that as a separate statistic? No, no. But I guess they yeah. can. They can go. If they wanted to, they could. And the runs that come uh, from the ghost runner are unearned. They're all, they're all unearned? Yeah. Oh, man. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's, ruin, it's really ruining the game. They yeah. Put in these crazy rules and, uh, and, and try to incorporate them into a meaningful, you know, Narrative for for the way way to, the history of the game. It just it make it make it's 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 so so silly. Do, I think. do you do you get the Saban news weather every Friday? Yeah, yeah, I do. I don't. Yeah, uh, the, 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 they, they, they they're offering a certificate in analytics. Yeah, right. <laughs> and every time I look at the analytics, you know, they have it in Phoenix the first weekend in March. Every time I look at that, I wouldn't last two seconds in any of those topics. I know, I know. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I, I, it's unfortunate because it, it it carries over into the publications, and the publications yeah. are just rife with stuff on you know stats that I never heard of, that I never never wanted to hear of, and are meaningless to me and. Uh, so I, I really very seldom read more than one or two articles in any of the publications because the others are just they're they're really speaking a foreign language to me uh, about a subject that I'm never not interested in. And the only uh, ones, you know, the only ones I buy into are OPS. And, OPS is, uh, a good, is a good introduction. That that was a very meaningful. Yeah, picture. and the pitching side whip. Yeah. You know, and, those, those, but, those two I accept. The rest of it is, you know, I, 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 OPS plus or all, all this other crap. I, I have no idea how they they calculate this stuff, and I'm, I have no interest in it. Now, why? Why explain to me why in WHIP they don't include hit by pitch? You know, you know it doesn't uh, count. <laughs> I have no idea. 
I have no idea. I, I thought I thought I always thought it was. Apparently, it's not, and it, it's uh, not included in your whip. And yeah, I, I don't believe in told. war or any of uh, any of that stuff. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, somebody once put uh, one of the groups on and was war good for, and I put down absolutely nothing. You know, from a song. Yeah, from years ago. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, yeah. My theory of of war. If you're like a Shohei Otani, and if you and whoever replaces Shohei Otani, especially since the Angels are not a good team, it's going to increase his war if you have a lousy replacement. Yeah. So if you're exactly. a star on a bad team, your war is going to be higher. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So anyway, yeah. we gotta cut this because Ralph. Yeah, will get this is this is, this is interesting though. I, this I is fantastic. Yes, today. yes and, so you, know, I. you brought back some real ghosts to, from to, for me <laughs> when we started talking about Bobby Lane. Uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I have a very big interest in uh, football and basketball history. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I I do too from the old, from the days when I was yeah. a kid. Less so oh, now. Yeah, because. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, one last thing, a uh, friend of mine calls me up today and asks me to name all the baseball players at three MVPs or more. So I left out two. I left out Albert Pujols and believe it or not, Alex Rodriguez. I said, <laughs> I said the only one I got with the two thousands was Barry Bonds because you know his infamy. But uh, who, I, I told him, I said, uh, once you get past 2000, forget it. Yeah. yeah. I know. I, I was about to too. find out that uh, A Rod uh, got three of them. So, all I, right. I, I wouldn't have uh, it. Yeah. Well, it's good. Yeah, it's been great, dude. Do okay. Yeah. I'm looking forward to our okay, already. Okay, thanks. Uh, we get we'll do one, another one soon and give my best to Marilyn. Will do. Thanks, Al. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.